Uh, today's speaker, Dennis Larson, um, uh, we have a Heritage Builders program, is what we call our history program for the foundation. And uh, we have a connection with Dennis, especially Karen Johnson, our curator, does, because they have collaborated on some books, history books. Uh, she and Dennis have collaborated on uh, books about Edward J. Allen. In fact, he's going to talk about that. It's on the, the Yankee on Puget Sound is one of those. Uh, he's a retired high school teacher, member of OCTA, which is the Oregon California Trails Association. And that's not all he belongs to. He belongs to a lot of things. He's also with the Puyallup Historical Society, used to be called the Ezra Meeker Historical Society. And our Tumwater Historical Association, he's a good part of that and helps with the newsletter each month. And, uh, well, for years he's researched and written and, and lectured about Pacific Northwest pioneers. And I mentioned the two books on Edward J. Allen, but he has also written about Ezra Meeker. Uh, two books about him, one called The Missing Chapters and the other called Slick as a Mitten, which is kind of an intriguing title. I haven't read that one yet. Sounds good. Uh, today's presentation is called Another Overland Route to Puget Sound and is going to be covering the, the building of the Pioneer Wagon Road over Natchez Pass in 1853 and 54. Uh, he's, he, he's not only going to relate about what the histories say happened, but also tell us what actually happened, I think. We're going to find out. Uh, a lot of history contains legend and uh, that's fun to hear about, but with further research and multiple sources, we can get closer to the truth behind the legends. And so he's going to be doing that, and I'm looking forward to hearing from him today. In fact, Dennis, if you want to make your way up here, let's welcome Dennis Larson. Okay, a couple housekeeping things first. Uh, you are in charge of keeping us at, from roasting, okay? <laughs> so he, there's a French door here, and so, you know, those of us who, it, there, this is a huge crowd, one of the biggest we've had, and so we're going to generate a lot of body heat, and we're going to try to keep the doors open as much as possible. The people in the far back, if you need to move in where, you, you know, and block the aisle, you can, uh, you know, we will just... If we have to escape, we'll just trample over here by this door. <laughs> okay. How many of you have been up to Natchez Pass? Okay, quite a few of you, okay. And how many of you know the story of Kill Another Ox? Oh, less, okay. All right. Well, the story of the building of the Natchez Pass Wagon Road and of the Longmire Biles Wagon Train coming over that road has become almost legendary in the history of Washington Territory. Over the last few years, I've been privileged to work with Karen Johnson in telling the story of Edward J. Allen, this man, uh, who was the guy who was actually in charge of building that wagon road. And in the process, we have learned that much of what has been accepted as fact about the events of 1853 and 54 is indeed not factual. Prior to our discovery of the Allen family documents, all that existed of the Allen writing was a brief 1853 letter in the Olympian, in the Olympian newspaper, the Columbian it was, and a short passage in Theodore Winthrop's 1913 edition of Canoe and Saddle. Today, we've heard nothing about from the guy, other than that, about the guy who actually built the road. Now today, I'm going to tell you the story of Natchez Pass, fact versus legend. Okay, Let's see if we can figure out how to work this now. Okay, Allen arrived in Olympia in December 1852 after coming west over the Oregon Trail and slogging his way up the mud-filled Cowlitz Trail. He stayed with a fellow Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania friend named Quincy Brooks while he went looking for a donation land claim site. Now, Allen filed his land claim on the other side of Bud Inlet from Quincy Brooks's cabin. Now, one of the things we've discovered is, you know, you have people use laser pointers to, you know, show you things. It won't work on a television. So we have to use the cursor. And so I have to play here for a second. Okay, here is Allen's land claim, outlined in red, and Quincy Brooks lived over here. Okay, now Allen's cabin was in this area, right over in this area, you see this boat here in the water? His cabin was right back in here. And he canoed every day when he wanted to go to Olympia, three miles down Bud Inlet, and that's the Capitol Dome right in there. Okay, in 1853, Washington Territory felt they needed some settlers. Now, that's kind of hard to believe today, but 
1853, they thought they needed more people here, partly because the population was 3,965. And we were just being split off from what was called or Northern, we were Oregon Territory, and we had just been split off from Oregon Territory. And so what had been previously called Northern Oregon in 1853 became Washington Territory. Now with the news that we had become a territory, also came word that Congress had appropriated $20,000 to build a military road, or a wagon road of some sort, from Fort Walla Walla to Stellicum, a road that would go over the Cascade Mountains somewhere. Now, the Fort Walla Walla we're talking about is over here. It's not by the city of Walla Walla, which is over this way, but it's right here where the Walla Walla, Walla, Walla River comes into the Columbia. And the wagon road would go over the mountains north of Mount Rainier and end up at Stellicum. Now there were, the immigrants when they arrived here, they came in October mostly. And right at the start of our wonderful, you know, Northwest rainy season. And they had a choice if they were heading for Puget Sound of three routes they could have taken. They could come up the Cowlitz Trail in November. Now, those who have lived here for very long know that November is one of our wettest months, and that Cowlitz Trail became a sea of mud, and sometimes it was virtually impassable. You could also go by a ship and take the route around, you know, the ocean route, but our November storms made that hazardous, and it was also very expensive. The third route was Natchez Pass. There was an old Indian trail that went across Natchez Pass, and it was used by the Hudson's Bay Company and Native Americans as sort of a trade route. Uh, the Catholic missionaries like Blanchette, who lived over here in the Yakima area, used it to travel back and forth to Puget Sound. In 1841, the Wilkes Expedition sent a party over the pass. The question was, could the pass be made suitable for wagons? And nobody really had an answer to that. Now, in 1853, Governor Isaac Stevens was sent by Jefferson Davis to explore a railroad route to the Pacific Ocean, well, to the Puget Sound, basically. He sent out exploring parties here in the south and here and here, and here was Stevens' route. And Stevens um, knew that he would get to the Cascades a little bit too late to explore the routes through the Cascade Mountains. So he hired a guy named Captain George B. McClellan to go ahead and around the Isthmus of Panama and up the coast and come to Vancouver Barracks here in Washington. And he was going to get there well ahead of Stevens and his job was to explore the Cascades and he had a couple other jobs that I'll get to in a second. Okay, now pay close attention to these orders, okay? Stevens wrote to McClellan, among your other duties I wish to put into your hand is the construction of a military road from Fort Walla Walla to Puget Sound. Okay, so he's supposed to build the road. McClellan also had explicit orders from Secretary of War Jefferson Davis putting him under Governor Stevens' command. So Stevens is his boss, okay? Jefferson Davis also added this. It's important that this road should be opened in season for the fall immigration. You will therefore use every exertion to do so. Should it be found impossible to accomplish this, you will at least endeavor to fix the line of the road, especially through the Cascade Mountains, and to perform such work on the most difficult portions of it as will enable the immigrants to render the route practical by their own exertions and detaching a suitable person as a guide and director to meet them at Walla Walla. Now those are pretty explicit orders. I mean, you know, he is supposed to build the road. If he finds that he can't do that, he is to make it as possible as he can for the wagon train people to, you know, improve it and get through. And he's supposed to leave a guide at Fort Walla Walla to take them across. Now, you know, this is military orders. You know, this is your commander ordering you, okay? All right, well, first they had to find out could it be used as a road because the people in Olympia and Puget Sound here were a 
Well, they were just pretty well convinced that the federal government wouldn't act fast enough to get the road built for the wagon train that was coming in that year. So they sent out what are called road viewers. Now, we call them today a survey party. Now, the road, they, they held a meeting in Olympia, kind of a general road meeting. And at the meeting, Edward J. Allen stood up and he read a statement from Father Blanchett, which described the route over Natchez Pass and made a few comments about its suitability as a wagon road. And they raised about $120 right on the spot to outfit the road viewers so they could go check out the pass and see if it could be made suitable for wagons. Okay, now, this is the map that we were handing out here. And the real advantage for Washington, if you look at the, the map here, is the purple lines at the bottom are the main Oregon Trail going into the Willamette Valley, and the red line is the route going over Natchez Pass. Well, the wagon trains that followed the purple route would arrive in the Willamette Valley in October, usually. And if they're heading for Puget Sound, that meant a November trip north up to Stellicum and up to Olympia, and, or a trip around the ocean like I showed earlier. But if they took the Natchez Pass, they would arrive in October, and they would beat the winter rains. And besides, then all these guys would not go to Oregon, which, you know, we kind of wanted. So who were the road viewers? Well, George, besides Allen, George Shazer, who was an American fur company employee who came over the Oregon Trail in 1845, and he operated the ferry boat at the Nisqually River. There was a ferry that right where the freeway basically is today. There was a ferry in that neighborhood, and he operated that. John Edgar, who was a Hudson's Bay Company employee since 1839, and Whitfield Kirtley, who was an Olympia School Board director. Now, until Allen's letters surfaced, virtually nothing was known about the activities of this exploring party beyond a short article by Allen that appeared in the Olympia newspaper. We now have pages of information that allow us to trace the day-to-day -day route of the road viewers as shown in this map. They crossed the Puyallup River, made their way up South Prairie Creek to the White River, and as you can see, getting on horses and traveling in the river bottoms was not easy. They got to the White River and they found it was too high to ford, so they unpacked, built sort of a footbridge out of the snags and things that were laying around and logs, and with the help of their Indian guides, got their gear across the river and set up camp about a mile upstream from where they crossed. Now they nearly lost a horse, and Allen impressed the party by going into the river and heroically saving the horse. And, you know, the, in the book, there's a whole passage about it. Karen Johnson loves this story, but I'm shortening it up here, okay? Uh, they reached the Greenwater River, and when they got to the confluence of the Greenwater and the White River, they turned left and followed the Greenwater up toward the mountains, and they ran into this, snow. And when they got to the snow, they realized that, yeah, maybe they were a little early. But they commenced their ascent, and as they approached the summit, they encountered a series of small prairies that were alternated by belts of timber. Probably looked something like this when they got there. They camped that night under a tree in the rain where they built a fire, and they attempted to dry themselves. Now, they woke in the morning dry except for their faces, which the rain had been beating down on all night, and their blankets, which from when they got up, the water just poured off of them and they proceeded across Government Meadow. Now, they got lost just on the other side of Government Meadow. Allen pulled out his compass, and this is what he said. When, where we entered the woods and began to descend gradually, I looked at my little compass and found we were traveling due south. This I knew must be wrong. I mentioned it to Edgar, who questioned our guide, and who confessed at last that he was completely bewildered. Well, that compass still exists. It's at the University of Pittsburgh in the Allen collection that's there. And I've actually had the privilege of holding it in my hand and kind of, you know, looking at it and realizing that this was actually what guided them over Natchez Pass. <coughs> Using his trusty compass, Allen guided the party down to the Little Natchez River where Edgar began to recognize the terrain and they followed the Little Natchez to the main Natchez. 
and they followed this down past what is today called Edgar Rock, where they broke into open country. Now this is, you know where Whistling Jacks is? Okay, this is just past that. And let's see if I can get this cursor to work, yeah. The trail didn't follow the river at this point. The trail went up behind Edgar Rock and came down this way. And so, you know, but they came out on the Natchez River just and left it and headed kind of into the open country, just a little bit past Whistling Jacks. And this is what it looked like where they broke into the open country. And from here to Fort Walla Walla, it was known to be open and suitable for wagons, so there was no need to go further. And Allen and Shazer raced back to Olympia to give them the word that, yes, we could make this into a wagon road. And Edgar and Kirtley came back more slowly, and they blazed the route as they went. Now, on the outskirts of Olympia, Allen met a party of ladies and gentlemen that were going to visit Judge Yantis. Now, Judge Yantis had a couple of young daughters, and they were being visited. Well, this is what Allen wrote. We met a party of ladies and gentlemen going out to Judge Yantis's. We dashed through them, scarce reining up to tell them the road could be made. We hurried on, the sound of their cheers following on our heels. We pitched into Olympia, almost to the other end of which we had to go, ere we could check our excited horses. Such a commotion as our arrival kicked up in that extensive place. We immediately delivered our brief report to the committee. Now, it wouldn't have taken long in those days to gallop from one end of the other of that extensive place. <laughs> now, the report was published in the Olympia newspaper, and until now, that's the only account that anybody had of this ex exploration party. Now, once Allen returned, the road builders and the residents geared up to actually build the road over the now surveyed Natchez Pass. Allen and others raised over $1,000 from the citizens of Stelicum and Olympia, and they were given supplies at cost by the local merchants. Dr. Tolmy of Fort Nisqually donated money and beef cattle at $5 a head. Now, Andrew Moore on the left here was the money manager, and Andy Burge on the right was their supply packer. Now, the road builders were able to take advantage of something that Michael Simmons had done. Back in 1850, Michael Simmons was going to try this same project, and he managed to build about six miles of trail from the Puyallup River through Bonnie Lake up to what's called Connell's Prairie. And so they just said, we'll just take advantage of the, what Michael Simmons built. And if you've never been up there, there's a little marker like that that kind of marks where the road came through. But once they entered the forests east of Enumclaw, and the prairies there, the building became much more difficult. There's a wonderful little section of the Natchez Trail in Federation Forest State Park, if you want to walk part of it, that's easy to get to. Now, the big trees cause problems. And the even larger ones were more of a problem. <laughs> now, cutting them was too time consuming. Occasionally, they would set sections on fire, and they'd burn their route through. But mostly, they looked for a way around these trees. Allen's Road had multitudes of twists and bends as it serpentined its way east. One hazard they encountered was hornet nests. And it was necessary often to send a man up in advance to destroy the nests so that the workers could actually work you know, peacefully. This was accomplished by using a 20-foot pole with a torch on the end to burn the nests. Now, you had to do this in the late evening when the hornets were at home and died with their habitation being burned. It had to be done 24 hours in advance because the woods were full of <coughs> homeless, angry insects. <laughs> and they were only too ready to take offense. Well, Alan wrote this description. It's kind of long, but it's quite good. Okay. Robert Moore on the right here was detailed for this special service, and he developed a speculative des desire to determine how close he could approach the nests while burning them, and continued to shorten his pole until it came almost to a hand operation. Brave man. 
Continued warning did not affect his ardent desire to decide the matter, while the indignation of the hornets was growing stronger than their surprise, and it culminated in a vicious attack from a special nest he was destroying, in which all the homeless hornets, which he had previously been the object of his attention, seemed to take part. His long hair was filled with them. All the bare places were covered with their legions, and they came from far and near, and they came through the air like bullets, striking the man with an absolute impact, who became frantic and tore through the woods, regardless of direction, knocking against pendant nests and calling out new enemies every minute. <laughs> he was blind and deaf, but not all dumb. He had frantically torn off all his clothing as he ran in a desperate endeavor to rid himself of the insects which had penetrated every inch of his clothing. And entirely naked, he had despairingly halted on the creek bank, standing over a bee's nest in the ground with a pendant hornet's nest overhead. <laughs> Unquestionably, he would have been killed there. But gathering together heavy bunches of brush, several of us, not without many bitter stings, rushed in and pushed him over the bank into the deep pool. And then falling flat on the ground, we lay quiet until the excitement had somewhat subsided and submitting to a few stings from such of the enemy who do not fully accept the usages of warfare, we crawled slowly away. <laughs> now, of all the hazards of building a road, you know, this was definitely an unexpected one. More recovered, but it took him several weeks. Okay, back to old Mr. McClellan. Yes, this is the same McClellan who commanded the Union Army during the Civil War the commander whom President Lincoln said had a case of the slows, <laughs> the commander that Lincoln eventually fired. Now, if the president had known about McClellan's actions here in Washington Territory in 1853, he might have saved himself a lot of grief and not appointed him in the first place. Now, as you can see, McClellan did not get started. You can see if we can make this cursor work. He started right here in this area. He didn't get started until July 18th, at which time the citizens of Puget Sound were already building a road, you know, the one that he's supposed to build. And it took him several days just to go a few miles away from Fort Vancouver. He had to keep going back to get this and that. And those slows again. Well, it took him almost a month until October, August 25th. And let's see if I can get the cursor to show you where we're at. Okay. He made his way up to Natchez Pass right here on August 25th, stayed one day overnight, and then went back and set up camp down in this, come on cursor, right there, okay? And then uh, on, uh, on the 12th of September, he had gone exploring up this way. This is where this cursor is at, and that's where Snoqualmie Pass is, is up in that direction. And that was one of the passes he was supposed to go explore. But he made it, you know, you can see, partway. Came back, and he found Andrew Moore in his camp waiting for him. And he said, hallelujah. And he started negotiating with Robert Moore right on the spot. And he hired Allen's guys, who were actually out here building the road, and put them under government contract and said, you guys are now in charge of building the road, and I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> and so he continued on. And eventually, he met Governor Stevens way up here in this part of the state, up at Fort Colville. And Governor Stevens had heard of the Longmire wagon train actually going over the pass, and had heard of, of some of the troubles that they had had. And so he wanted McClellan to at least go to the pass and survey it. Now, McClellan found all kinds of reasons not to do that. And, you know, finally it looked like he was going to have to go, and then magically the barometers broke. And Stevens shrugged his shoulders, threw in the towel, and gave up. And he returned down the Columbia River and made his way up to Olympia and became our first governor. McClellan trailed along kind of slowly behind. He didn't get up here until December. Now, for a brief time that summer, Natchez Pass was really a busy place. There was a lot of back and forth traffic. Uh, east side road workers under Whitfield Kirtley were going one way. Army troops and packers bringing supplies to McClellan were going the other way. 
dispatch riders carrying messages from McClellan were heading west, and even the odd tourists like Theodore Winthrop and his guide would show up. Now, it was inevitable that some of these people would bump into each other. And on August 26, Theodore Winthrop, going east, encountered Lieutenant Hodges and his men heading west. Now, Hodges had just passed through Allen's camp, where he stopped briefly to exchange news, and then the two parties went their separate way. That night, as darkness enclosed in the woods, Winthrop stumbled into Allen's camp, and he described the stay quite eloquently in the canoe and saddle. If you've never read that book, it's one that you should put on your list. It's a, a really neat story about a tourist wandering, wandering around in Puget Sound in the 1850s. Okay, where does this road actually go? Okay, let's try to use the cursor. It starts way down here in the Enumclaw area, works up the, the river valley, the White River, turns and comes up the Greenwater River, and then runs up this ridge, and then when it gets in the ridge top, it follows along like this. Now, all these things that you see here are logging roads that are up there today, and part of them is the Jeep Road, which I'll get to in a minute. And then it continues along like this to here, and it reaches a series of meadows. And the meadows are quite wet, but they also supplied good feed for their stock animals. The largest meadow up there is called Government Meadow, and it's this strip right in here. And this is taken from the top of Pyramid Peak, which I'll get to in a little bit. And then it can, and the Natchez Pass itself is right about here. And then the trail continues on east. Now, Government Meadow is, like I said, the biggest one, and it's green. And what does that mean? Water. <laughs> And so when the wagons got here, they did not go through Government Meadow. They went through the trees off to the left. And there's a nice sign up there at the summit, or close to it anyhow, telling you that you've arrived at Natchez Pass. Only thing is, that's not Natchez Pass. Now the sign is in the tree, ooh, the sign is in the tree behind me, back in here. And you can see the road just kind of coming out there. I'm walking toward what is Natchez Pass, and it's marked by this. It's the only place in the state of Washington where four counties touch. Now, who can name the four counties? Kittitas, I heard one. Yakima, King, and Pierce. Now your job is to figure out who's standing in which county. <laughs> Probably close to noon. <laughs> okay. Um, learning about Allen's activities in 1854 was difficult. Once he uh, went on the government contract, he ordered his family to stop publishing his letters. And accordingly, it required a little bit of detective work to put our story together for this year. Now, remember Captain McClellan. Okay. He's made his way up to Olympia, and he wrote his mother a letter where he described Olympia. We have to pass the winter at Olympia on Puget Sound, a flourishing city of some 10 or 12 houses. Fine prospect that. As there are no houses in Olympia that can be had, I expect to spend the winter in a tent, labored by the rain and mud. For you must know that we don't expect to see the sun anymore until next summer. <laughs> Except that he was right, wasn't he? <laughs> Except at rare and short intervals of time, it's raining almost constantly. I don't think much of it, the Pacific Coast. It is surely vastly overrated in every respect. <laughs> now, he didn't have to spend the winter in a tent. He came knocking on the door of Allen's cabin and was invited to stay. Allen served that winter as his private secretary for McClellan, writing reports and working on a Chinook jargon dictionary with George Gibbs who also spent the winter in the cabin. Now, Gibbs was an ethnographer and an artist who had come west with Governor Stevens. and his version of the dictionary got published, Allen's remains with his papers in the, at the University of Pittsburgh. That's Allen's at the bottom there. That's just kind of a section of it. Now, Governor Stevens had 
also ordered Captain McClellan to explore Snoqualmie Pass from the west as soon as he got to Olympia. Now, McClellan continued to complain to his mother. In addition, I have to start again for the mountains as soon as we reach there, a trip of perhaps three weeks in the rain and mud until we reach the mountains and then snow. As I never saw a snowshoe in my life except in a museum or a picture book, I don't anticipate much pleasure during the jaunt and am desirous of finishing it as soon as possible. He made it just past Snoqualmie Falls, miles from Snoqualmie Pass, <laughs> where he encountered a foot of snow, declared it impassable, and returned to Olympia. <laughs> the dreaded snowshoes never made an appearance. A short time later, A.W. Tinkham made his way over Snoqualmie Pass from the east through McClellan's impassable snow and delivered a report on the prospects of the pass to the governor. That was the final straw. Stevens fired McClellan and sent him back to Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're Lincoln appointed him general, yeah. <laughs> okay. The members of the Longmire Biles wagon train, the first to go over the new road in 1853, complained about how rough and sketchy it was and of the difficulties they had in traversing it, especially in getting down the final steep cliff. A second party came over the trail in November, and they weren't quite as vocal. Now, Allen wrote, it most assuredly was not sandpapered. <laughs> Oops, I don't want to go away yet. Allen, now under government contract, spent the next spring and summer improving this road. Winfield Eby, who came over the new and improved version in 1854, said this. Last year, the immigrants were compelled to let down their wagon by ropes or with large trees tied to them. Here we found that Mr. Allen had made a fine grade so that we descended quite easily. For about half a mile, the road is cut into the side of the mountain. On the lower side is a handrail for the entire distance. After our book was published, Roger Blair, an Oregon, California Trails Association member, located this photograph, which shows the actual logs that Allen used and cut to, and placed along the road to buttress it. This is where the handrail was. This is kind of a neat picture. Now, E.B. also had to say something about Allen's showmanship. The next day, as the wagon descended the mountains, to our right was Mount Ike, a tall, bare, rocky peak. On its summit, we could just see an American flag waving in the morning breeze. It was put there a few days since by Mr. Allen. It was just a way to welcome the wagon trains into Washington. Kind of a nice touch. And I'm standing right about where the wagons would have been, so that's the view they would have had. So it had to be a fair-sized flag to be seen. Now, the road builders were never paid for the work that was done prior to Andrew Moore signing his contract with McClellan. Allen spent years unsuccessfully petitioning Congress to right this wrong. So what, what's there of the road today? Okay. Several cairns like this mark the wagon road in western Washington. The bottom one, the circle, is at Rogers High School. And the one on the top left is at uh, DuPont, actually Ponder's Corner. And the one on the top right is in uh, Spanaway. It's a noted Jeep trail today, and it's in absolutely excellent condition where it's level and dry. But. It's badly eroded where it's steep. And you'll see what I mean by badly eroded. And it's very muddy where wet. Only the cliff section of the trail is closed to motorized vehicles. And I'm standing here on the cliff section. Now, there are three myths about the Natchez Pass Wagon Road that have wormed their way into the history books and they've become accepted as historical gospel. Allen's letters and recent research have pretty well proven these myths to be false. So what are they? Okay, the first one. The road builders quit early, and they left the incoming 1853 wagon trains to their own devices in finding their way through the Cascade Mountains. Some texts state that the Indians told Al, the wagon train, Allen and his workers, that no wagons were coming. Others just say the road workers gave up and went home. Others simply don't give reasons. Well, this event 
supposedly, this supposed event is dead wrong. Well before they began their descent from the mountains, the Longmire Biles wagon train dispatched James Aiken to ride ahead and seek desperately needed food. Allen and his crew were working on a section of the trail much farther west when Aiken encountered them. Both Robert Moore and Allen rode of this surprise meeting. Allen said they were camped in the Puyallup River in one of our miserable rainy days when Aiken appeared seeking provisions for his hungry people left behind. Allen immediately sent Andy Birch ahead, the packer, if you remember him, with 300 pounds of flour and orders to give to everybody freely. He gave Aiken dinner, rode with him to the Nisqually Ferry where Aiken went on to Olympia and Allen went to Stellicum. Here Allen procured fresh supply of provisions and returned to his camp. This encounter took place on September 26th. Allen's letters state that at least a portion of the workers were in the field until October 8th. They didn't quit early. They were just working on a segment of the trail closer to the settlements when the wagon train emerged from the mountains. Now the second myth casts even more doubt on this supposed happening. Okay, this is Andy Burge. Andy Burge supposedly told the immigrants, go back because the way ahead was too hard. Defies logic that Burge would have said this. Let's set the scene. He met the wagon train as it was descending the infamous cliff. He came with 300 pounds of flour and word that more food was on the way. He'd been back and forth over that trail many times that summer. He'd seen all the traffic that had used the road. He knew it was passable. He also knew there was grass for the animals at a place called Bear Prairie that was just ahead. And he knew that the immigrants had just come down the most difficult section of the trail. Now he might have advised them to rest their animals on the prairies just above the cliff, but it makes no sense that we'd have told them, go back. James Longmire's 1892 account is the only mention of this. His memoir containing this account was written from interview notes taken by Mrs. Lou Palmer a few years before Longmire died. She wrote using Longmire's voice, but the words were hers. Longmire may have embellished a story that didn't need embellishing, and perhaps Mrs. Palmer did the embellishing. Either way, it defies logic, and I just don't believe it happened. And finally, Andy Burge's very presence with that 300 pounds of flour speaks strongly to the fact that Allen and his workers were still in the field. The alternate explanation for his presence implies he was wandering in the woods with 300 pounds of flour and stumbled <laughs> into the wagon train. That makes no sense either. But the third myth is the best one. Kill another ox. Let's read the sign here first. The Natchez Cliff. In October 1853, a 148 member Longmire party snubbed 53 of its wagons down this impassable 1,000 foot high, 45 degree glacier carved precipice using thongs from oxen butchered from their hides to supplement their Meeker ropes, rope supply. Now, Ezra Meeker tells the tale with a bit more drama. Go around this hill, they could not. Go down it with logs trailed to the wagons as they had done before, they could not. As the hill was so steep, the logs would go end over end and be a danger instead of a help. So the rope they had was run down the hill and found to be too short to reach the bottom. One of the leaders of the party turned to the men and said, kill a steer, and they killed a steer cut his hide into strips and spliced it into the rope. It was found yet to be too short to reach the bottom. The order went out, kill two more steers. And two more steers were killed and their hides cut into strips and spliced into the rope, which then reached the bottom of the hill. And by the aid of the rope and the strips of these hides of those three steers, 29 wagons were lowered down the mountainside to the bottom of the steep hill. Only one broke away and it crashed down the mountain and was smashed to splinters. Now, that story originated with George Himes. He was the secretary of the Oregon Historical Society. He was a nine-year-old boy in 19, 1853 when that wagon train was going down that cliff. Let's look at the geography. What you're looking at is indeed a cliff. But the wagons didn't go down anything like this. They went down a much gentler grade off to the left. As you can see, only the top section is steep. 
From the bottom of this so-called cliff, the grade eases considerably and the total drop to the Greenwater River is less than the thousand feet that the sign says. As you can see off you know, the picture on the left, you can see that the grade eases a lot. This picture is taken at the top of the cliff. In 1853, the route was treed, just like it is today. Allen actually cleared out the underbrush among the large trees all the way down, giving the wagons a clear path. Since the route was treed all the way down, it was possible to lower the wagons part way, tie them off, and retrieve the top rope, and continue lowering. The steepest section's at the top, as I mentioned, and it's not very long. Meeker said about 30 feet. I'd say a little longer. The drop is in sections, with a gentle section between a steeper grade. Only the top part would have caused the immigrants problems. Now, Ray Egan is standing here next to the trail, about halfway down the steepest part of the section, of the steepest section, the top part. At an OCTA symposium held in Pendleton last July, he presented a paper in which he thoroughly demonstrated the unlikelihood of this ox killing to make a rope ever happening. His paper will be published in an upcoming volume of the Overland Journal. Now, for those of you who are observant, you may have noticed the number of wagons varies with the teller. But what never goes away is kill another ox. <laughs> so what's wrong with the story? Well, first it was strongly denied by Van Ogle, who at the time was an adult member of the party. He and Himes got into an argument about who was telling the truth, an argument that was played out in the Washington Historical Quarterly. Himes made claims of meeting with wagon train members who supposedly supported his statements. Ray Egan has demonstrated pretty conclusively that those meetings did not take place. He used Himes' journal to pinpoint where Himes was when he said the meetings were and then found out where the other people were and they were nowhere near each other. Second, Egan has demonstrated that a goodly supply of rope was a basic for any immigrant traveling over the Oregon Trail. It's a reach to think there was not enough rope in the wagon train to accomplish the lowering of the wagons down this grade. And third, Allen wrote he left a rope at the top. Fourth, there's no mention in any of the accounts of the wagon train members eating the freshly killed oxen. All reported they were virtually out of food when they reached the cliff. Surely a feast of freshly killed beef would have deserved some sort of mention. And finally, some of the accounts were written in the 1892-93 as part of a contest to tell the best Oregon Trail story, <laughs> sponsored by the Tacoma Ledger, the prize of which was a free trip to the Chicago World's Fair, giving ample motivation for embellishment. Now, Egan rightfully points out that Washington has few quality historical myths on which we can hang our hats, so to speak. And he suggests we might want to hang on to this one. I'd argue the factual story of the Natchez Pass Wagon Road is amazing enough and really needs no embellishment. So summing up, two wagon trains came over Allen's Road in 1853, four to six trains came over the next year, and then came the Indian Wars, and for a couple of years it was used only by the combatants. In the 1860 to 1880 time period, it was used primarily as a stock trail. Uh, one of the main users of that trail was David Longmire, who had a herd of cattle in the Weenus Valley, and he would drive them over the trail each summer and fall to the Puget Sound markets. Today, it's a Jeep road. And the shameless commerce part. I have a few books left. My wife is selling them in the back. And if you want to learn more about this story, go ahead. I, now I'll take questions. Okay. Okay, you, you mentioned the uh, uh, traffic across the uh, pass during the Indian Wars. I uh, understood there was a story about the Army burying one or more cannons uh, in government meadows, and one uh, South County historian told me that a friend of his had uh, uh, seen one of the part of one of the cannons protruding from the ground for some years. Do you have any information on that? No, this is the first I heard this story. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Number I'll, four. I'll check it out. <laughs> any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, do we know what uh, type of wagons they had? You know, there was several different wagons right. came across yeah. the country. 
and, and these big Conestoga no, wagons were huge. Yeah, no, they didn't take Conestogas. They, well, they, they were using much small, smaller wagons than that. More like today's um, rancher's uh, uh, chuck wagon. Yeah, it, it, have any of you ever seen the Meeker wagon when they bring it out and kind of, you know, things? Well, that's the size wagon that they would have had. It's it's much smaller than a Conestoga. The Conestogas were way too big to do the cross-country travel like that. The only person I know of who was, in quotes, dumb enough to do that was Reed, the, the member of the Donner Party, and he got his stuck in the, you know, in the muck outside of Salt Lake. Okay? Yeah, the College Trail from... Uh... Fort Vancouver up, up in mm. Wasn't most of that by water? Not most of, about half of it. Half of it. Yeah. They, 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 they went, unloaded Toledo, didn't they? Right. And, and the section that was just absolute mud was from Toledo to here. Yeah. And the part that was the worst was in the Centralia Chehalis area. Yeah. And in, in the book, there's a, a wonderful description. Alan was dumb enough to come up here in December. <laughs> and so there's a description of him coming up that mud-filled trail. But what they would do is they would they would get to the mouth of the Cowlitz River one way or another. There were a few steamboats running around back then. And then they would come up by canoe up the Cowlitz River to Toledo, to the Cowlitz Landing. And from there it was overland. But it was so bad that in the winter you just tried not to do it. Mm -hmm. When did they name Olympia? I don't know, Don, when did they name Olympia? Wasn't it Smithfield before it was Olympia? It was, it was. Levi Lathrop Smith was the partner of Edmund Sylvester, and Smith had an epileptic fit in a canoe out of the sound and, dr and drowned, so Sylvester inherited his part of the claim, and he laid out the town and called it Olympia by the looking at the Olympic mountains in the distance. Just, just as an aside, one, you know, Alan, besides his donation land claim, he bought 10 acres from Sylvester here in Olympia, and he chose very well which, to, which piece of property to buy. Uh, the Capitol campus, going through the residential area, you know, the historical section of town, he bought 10 acres right there, and he hung on to it until 1909. And he deeded over one little strip of it the, to, to the Capitol, to build the Capitol. And Lanny Weaver and I were going through the records, and he wrote, a codicil into there that said it can only be used for a road. If you don't, if you ever cease to use it as a road, it reverts back to the original owners. And they were doing construction here a couple of years ago on, on that road that comes in, you know, to the Capitol, and we were wondering, were they actually going to close it off or what? <laughs> uh, tur turned out that they actually, they must have read the codicil. <laughs> yeah, back here. <clears throat> was it Governor Stevens that thought so much of McClellan that he named McClellan Butte? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who named McClellan Butte. Uh, and McClellan didn't get anywhere near it. No. You know? <laughs> so I'm not sure who named it. Mm -hmm. These wagons that came over not so fast, what were they being pulled with? Oxen. Always oxen. Uh, yeah, all, all, almost always oxen. Horse. Horses were used occasionally, but the the oxen were the primary animal used. And would they use multiple hitches? Um, it varied. You know, most of the wagons would have four oxen. You know, four. Yeah. And you know, sometimes if you were going up a steep hill or something, you would double team them, and you know, put eight on the wagon to get them up the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, wagons did really well going straight up the hill and straight down the hill. They did not do well going sideways across hills, and so when they got to something like the Natchez Cliff, what they, you know, what they would had to do was go straight down, and if it was too steep for the cattle to, you know, they called them cattle, to, you know, maintain control of the wagon, then they would, you know, ride them down with the brakes on. They would tie logs behind them so that there was some weight to pull them, and occasionally they would use, you know, trees and winch them down. And you know they tried all those methods here supposedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where in relationship to the Olympia Country Club or the Evergreen State College was? It, uh, where's where's the cabin was? The land. Uh, just you know what Tickle Cove is? No. Okay, it's it's just a little bit past the Country Club. No. If, yeah, out toward the point. All the way over to El Dinwood. Yeah, he also had a nice piece of property there. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Didn't McClellan run for uh, president against Lincoln? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, Lincoln could have saved himself a lot of grief if he would have paid attention to McClellan's activities when he was out here. When, when you read the letters he writes to his mother, you just kind of, you go, wow. <laughs> and, you know, those barometers, I'm convinced they they were broken on purpose by McClellan. When you, when you read the, the commentary between him and Stevens, Stevens was pretty adamant that he wanted McClellan to go explore you know, Natchez Pass, and McClellan was equally adamant that he wasn't going to do that. Hmm? What, uh, technology, did they, did they have prospect files or double bit access yet, or what, what, what were they using to actually build? Um, you mean for the road? Yep. Yeah, they would have been just cross-cut saws. You know, the, they didn't have prospect files. Like yeah, well, yeah, and the, the misery did type saw. Yeah. Do you have any estimate number of people that actually went across the Natchez yeah, the first year there were two wagon trains, and there were around 140 in the first wagon train. And the second one, they had a bit of misinformation. They came through in November, and they were told that the pass was closed because of snow. And so they left their wagons at the Autana Mission over by Yakima, and they came across on foot, and they found out that there was like two or three inches of snow up there. And they were probably in the vicinity of another 150 in that. The following year, there were at least four wagon trains that came over that I've been able to document, maybe six. It sort of depends on what you call a wagon train and what you don't. And the last wagon train to come over was the one that had Ezra Meeker's parents and his brother in it. And that one came over in November of 1854. And then the Indian Wars came, and you know it was too dangerous to use. Mm -hmm. Just uh, interesting. McClellan wasn't about to do that. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. But did you say that the, the route was closed after the Indian Wars? It wasn't closed. It was just, it was basically ceased to be used by wagon trains. Was it, yeah. What route was used by immigrants after? They had to go back to using the College Trail or coming up by the ocean. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, what happened back east to get people to decide to take this trip over Natchez Pass. I mean, oh, they must have gotten some kind of advertisement or something. Well, actually, you know, in the book we document quite a bit of the little, you know, back and forth tug of war that went on between Oregon and Washington. And we sent out people as far as the Blue Mountains in Oregon, uh, Nelson Sargent in particular, to inform the wagons that, you know, there is now a <coughs> shortcut right to Puget Sound. And the Oregon newspapers were publishing stories saying, you know, this is all nonsense. They're just trying to trap you to go into the mountains and die up there like the Donner <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there, there was a lot of you know, back and forth play. Uh -huh. um, the first year, especially, you know, there, you know, the road was brand new. And as Alan said, it was most assuredly not sandpapered. Right. And, you know, the, the, the Longmire people did a lot of complaining but most of the complaining came in the later years when that contest was going on. You know, there wasn't a lot of complaining that I've been able to document. You know, in the when they first arrived. Mm -hmm. I understand that uh, when the railroad survey came over Snoqualmie Pass, Doc Maynard and a group from Seattle merchants met them at Snoqualmie Falls to try to direct them to go south of, of uh, Lake Washington. If they had followed the river, they would have ended up in Everett. Mm -hmm. They wanted that railroad into Seattle, and so they redirected that that route. Do you remember that railroad survey crew that was doing it? Do you remember who that was? Well, that wasn't the problem. Was no, no, that was. You mean the Tinkham was the guy who came over Snoqualmie Pass and first demonstrated to Stevens that it could be used for a railroad, okay. and and he came over in that impassable snow, and you know that's when Stevens. <laughs> Blue his cork and said, McClellan, you're out of here. But is this, yeah. that, that was, was that when Maynard met him at Snoqualmie Falls? I don't think, I think that happened later, but I'm not sure on that. The that's that's why the railroad went yeah. 
from Sopalmi down mm -hmm. down south of uh, Lake Washington. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Yeah.